Hello everyone, welcome back to my continuing tutorial campaign in Realistic Progression Zero, the campaign mod for the Realism Overhaul suite of Realism Mods for KSP. Um, so, in a long and labored uh, attempt at reaching the moon in the last episode, which took an hour and 45 minutes real time, we did finally make it, uh, although I goofed twice and had to reload because uh, I gave up like two and a half lunar windows, which would have been vital. And then of course once I reloaded, uh, the first time I launched, we impacted the moon. Um, so now what we're going to do, because we have lots of, lots and lots of science, um, because we have unlocked uh, our engines node, uh, because we have lots of money. So we're going to work on some new launch vehicles. So what does that mean? First, we've got to upgrade our launch pad because 40 tons just not going to cut it. That's going to take a little while, and that took a bite out of our funds. Now, we have half a year until stability early probes unlocks. That's when we'll get controllable probes. That's when we can start, for example, putting things in lunar orbit, when we can send things interplanetary. We can do all sorts of fun stuff. Basic construction. That gives us um, a couple engine upgrades that lets us have larger tank diameters, uh, and that gives us access to service modules, which are much more efficient uh, for pressure-fed upper stages than type fuselage, which is what we're using now. So let's go ahead and spend some of the science. We have 70 science points. Um, so, yeah. I think basically because I'm not even bothering with planes at all this campaign, um, I'm going to go ahead and do a hybrid approach where we do like both the Russian engine approach and the US approach. So that means we do want basic solids. Um, that will give us access, this node itself, to the Altair kick motor, uh, which is a great little kick motor. Where is it? Uh, that's Kester 1. That's the Altair kick motor. Um, and this is, what is this? Ah, no, that's that's procedural solids, which I don't really use. Um, so the Altair is a neat little kick motor that, for example, that single Altair would probably replace our entire three stages of baby sergeants. Uh, it's just that nice. The caster is a great strap-on solid booster rather than vacuum kick motor. Uh, it can also be used in sounding rockets. I mean, both of these can. Um, so we're researching that. Um, but I think rather than go ahead and research it now, instead, come on. Not sure why it's not letting me select that. Uh, we know we want this. There. Okay. Just a, a weird click bug. All right. So we're also going to want mature orbital rocketry before too long, and stage combustion also very nice because that gives us access to some really nice Russian engines, like ridiculously nice. Um, for example, the NK9, which later became the NK15 for the N1, and later became the NK33. Uh, which was used in Antares until it, it blew up. Um, that has amazing... The, the NK-33, and less so the, the NK-15 and then NK-9, have great thrust-weight ratio. They have amazing specific impulse um, for a first-stage Carolox engine. 328 vacuum. That's better than any upper stage we have right now. Um, the NK-9V which was used on the N1 on the upper, the, the third and fourth stage uh, in varying forms, um, has 345 seconds vacuum, which is amazing. Um, the S1-5400, which later becomes the RD-58, is another great vacuum engine, um, and it has the ability to reignite. It has five ignitions. Then we also have these hypergolic engines for that were used on the Proton. Those they're very cheap, 
they have a heck of a lot of thrust and they have pretty decent specific impulse. Uh, so that's a quite amazing note. Um, if we got mature orbital rocketry, which gives us the um, another upper stage engine, this one's gas generator rather than stage combustion, um, it'll give us the H1, which was used on the Saturn 1 and Saturn 1B. It's basically a derivative of the LR89 and 79. So will give us, I don't know why that radial decoupler's there, uh, and the Astros, which is a great pressure-fed small upper stage engine was used on the Europa 1 and 2 launch vehicles, neither of which were really successful. Um, so that's all s super useful, but, but if we get that, we can't get anything else. Baby sol uh, basic solids we talked about, survivability gives us heat shields. Now, presumably we're going to, our next major effort, along with going to the moon some more, is going to be launching a capsule, so we're also definitely going to want to do this. So probably what we want to do is get survivability first, um, because it provides us with some really useful stuff. Um, we can get by without basic solids until a bit later, uh, although it would be nice to have them so that we could make our, our lunar orbiters and things. Um, and then we can get, once that finishes unlocking, we can get basic capsules, and then we can actually put a human being into orbit as well as just all these these satellites. Um, so the other thing we want to look into is improved instrumentation, which offers some seriously nice solar panels, and it offers the the dish that we will need to go interplanetary when we want to go interplanetary. Um, I don't know why there's two of... Oh, that's right, because I'm using the old version of Venstock Revamp that has issues. And it unlocks a better probe core. But that is something that we probably want to deal with after we pay our science for basic capsules. So, yeah, I mean, I think probably what we're going to want to do is do this first so that we can do re-entry, survivable re-entry. Um, and we can along with stability and early probes, which gives us the film camera, we can get a ton of science from Earth orbit as well as from Moon orbit. So let's go ahead and get this. Then we have... Still we have 50 science and these. So yeah, so let's go ahead and get basic solids. Come on. Um, hmm. Not really sure why it's not letting me click on that. Well, we'll do it out of order then. It seems to not be letting me click on any of these things. That is interesting. Uh, let's look at the input box. Nope, still not letting me do it. All right, so let's pop out of the facility and pop back, because maybe then it'll let me do it. Nope, it's... Oh, I think, do we need this first? No. Research that, and we have 30 science left. Okay, now it's finally worked properly. We've used up all our science, and we'll get we'll get staged next probably. Uh, so let's go ahead and spend the upgrade points. We got three upgrade points from doing all that. So we'll spend them all on R&D, so we can research faster. Our launch pad is currently upgrading. It's going to take almost a year. 
um, will be a while. We can go ahead and scrap this because we're never ever launching that thing again. Uh, uh -huh. So let's look at what we have on offer. A lot more contracts. We're not going interplanetary yet because that's just not a thing that we're really capable of doing. But what we are capable of doing is building a new launch vehicle. So here's our old launch vehicle. It's not that far removed from what we'll want to use in the future. However, we can finally get rid of this clunky setup involving 50 million baby sergeants. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, we're going to add this, which will serve us as dead weight, so we can figure out, you know, how much payload we can loft. Um, that's optimistic. Let's try 300 kilos for now. Excuse me. Um, so, we'll plop this back in. And take the clamps off because we're not going to need them for a bit. So now we are faced with a question. Uh, and that question is, what launch vehicle should we build? We've essentially so far been operating with like a cut rate Thor Able. Um, it's a funny hybrid of the three sergeant stages of Juno 1 and then the Able stage from Vanguard and Thor Able, which is basically the same as the, the Delta A stage. Uh, and then the lower stage has been broadly equivalent to the Redstone slash Jupiter C slash Juno 1 lower stage. It's just somewhat better because it's higher specific impulse and thrust um, and much, much lower structural fraction, like ridiculously lower. Um, so it's somewhere between ca the capability of the Vanguard first stage and the Thor first stage. Uh, so that's reasonable. So now what we want to figure out is we're going to need a suite of launch vehicles to cover our requirements moving forward. Um, and we have a bunch of engine choices to do that with. We already own the AJ-10 early. And we could get the AJ-1042, which is what was used on uh, Delta, I think, or was that Able? I think 101A was Able. Um, yeah, yeah, we could do that. It has a, it ha it w it'll allows you to stretch the stage, has a slightly lower specific impulse. Um, but it is a lot more reliable. And if you remember from the last episode, we had a bunch of a bunch of failures. Um, Um, so the question is whether we want to sink money into this. I am not sure we do, even though it's dirt cheap to purchase. Um, because we probably want to just ditch this stage. Instead, we have a bunch of options for an upper stage. We have the AJ-10 mid, which I talked about last episode. It was used on Ablestar and then used on Delta E through Delta what? Uh, and it says, oh, I actually, I, I wrote that description. Um, okay. Uh, that 
is rather more reliable. It has a higher specific impulse by a fair amount, 278 seconds. Uh, but most important, it has infinite ignitions, uh, which is extremely useful, as you might well imagine. Um, that's one option. We're going to skip the Gamma 2 and Gamma 8 because even though they're pretty cheap um, and they have good sea level specific impulse, they're not really useful long-term engines. They don't have any upgrade options. They use kerosene and high-test peroxide, which is just not a very energetic propellant mixture. Um, so now we have the basic engines used on Thor and Atlas. Um, so this is what was used on Thor and Jupiter. Uh, close cousin to the LR-89, which was the boosters on Atlas. LR-105 was the sustainer on Atlas. Also worked well as a second stage engine. And the LR-101 verniers, which were used on Thor and Atlas. Um, on the Russian side, we have the RD-0105-109, which is a good um, upper stage engine. It's much, much more efficient, 316 seconds, than these hypergolic things, but of course it can only ignite once. Um, then we have the RD 107 and 108, which are used in the R7 launch vehicle, still used today. Um, and then we have the XLR 81, which is the Gene engine I was talking about last episode. So, yeah, so let's consider what our needs are going to be. Our needs are going to be we want to send stuff to the moon and get into lunar orbit. We're going to want to send up a bunch of satellites into Earth, Earth orbit. Um, and we're going to want to send up stuff that we can recover and eventually send up a capsule. So that means that we're going to need some kind of lower stage engine and that means we're probably going to need more than one upper stage engine. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think these en so these engines do have better performance. They have somewhat worse reliability, uh, and we've just had a deep and lasting experience with unreliable engines. Um, and they don't have much in the way of growth options. The LR79 and LR89, um, you can get the H1 fairly cheap as an upgrade from them. You can carry over some of your research and the H1 will get to like 11, 1200 kilonewtons, I think, vacuum, which is almost double the thrust starting out. So I think we'll go with, we'll go with the LR79 um, as our base engine. It's quite reliable. Um, then we need upper stage. Now, just to start with, before we research all this other stuff, the stuff we'll be doing is chucking stuff at the moon and um, putting stuff in Earth orbit to fulfill Earth orbit contracts. So we're really going to need something that's restartable. This is not restartable until we finish researching basic construction. Uh, once we do, however, then it can relight once, and it's an exceptionally useful engine, particularly the the model used for the Gemini Agena target vehicle, um, which if you look down here, uh, XLRBA 13, model 8247, Gemini ATV, 71, 291 second specific impulse, does not, is not subject to Elwich, has 15 ignitions. Then 89639 used on like a and stuff, used high density acid, even higher specific impulse, back to two ignitions, but still worthwhile. Um, 
then some series upgrades that were never flown but were proposed in, in some testing. Um, three 12 seconds, three ignitions. And then this final variant, three 24 seconds, 15 ignitions again. So, and they have some considerable burn time. Although, the downside, of course, is that the Agena A, the, the BA-5, whatever it is, uh, yeah, uh, has a burn time of only 120 seconds, and it's just not that good. So, yeah, we will probably want that eventually, because it's just a darn useful engine. Um, And I think we'll skip this. It's just not useful enough. We want some verniers because we're going to... We'll certainly have a launch vehicle that uses only one LR-79. So we need verniers for roll control in the first stage. Um, so now we come back to what do we do for the upper stage. Uh, and I think probably what we do for the upper stage is... Uh, I think it's probably best to wait until we get access to better XLR 80 once before um, getting one. So we'll just go ahead and get this, which will give us the ability to relight an orbit. Lots of other good stuff. So let's go ahead and design something that's basically Thor Abelstar. Um, because it's just, you know, an exceptionally useful launch vehicle as these things go. So, step one is we get rid of that, and we go up to the diameter of that stage, which is, whoops, we'll go back to auto shape for now, one point or five meters. Uh, we're gonna underburn slightly because we don't want to have something that masses more than five tons. Because this, we only have five tons worth of avionics. Um, remove bottom. Okay. And then put this back here, 1.45. No, that's 1.5. Uh, remove all the tanks again. And let's get rid of this for now. And get rid of this, because we're not going to use it anymore. Make this bigger again. Um, how much nitrogen is that? That's a lot of nitrogen. Uh, I don't think we want that much nitrogen. I think we probably want something like 6,000 units of nitrogen. But we'll remove the UDMH and the white fuming nitric acid. Okay. We will also remove these spin motors because they are not actually going to provide us any worth. And actually, I think I'll go up to 7,000 nitrogen. So, yeah, about 9 kilograms of nitrogen. Not that much nitrogen, but enough. So the last thing we're going to do is now that we can restart, instead of using ullage motors or hot staging or any of those fun things, we're going to add some thrusters. Use RCS as our ullage thrusters. Oops, that's in that's in 1x symmetry. I want 4x symmetry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, 
Uh, and what do we want to call this? I guess we can call this, if we call that ballista, we can call this catapult or something. Um, we'll call it scorpion. Uh, for those of you familiar with classical and middle age siege weaponry, scorpion was sort of another kind of ballista. Um, let's put the AJ-10 on here. And let's see how much burn t how long a burn time we have with what we have um, yeah six minutes that's that's rather long uh, that's optimistic for utilization Okay, five minutes burn time. That's that's fine. All right. Now, interesting fact, um, <laughs> because the fuselage tank type is has such a high structural coefficient, because that AJ ten one hundred four D has a low specific impulse, uh, we may get more delta V by underloading these tanks. Um, or by just doing it at four minutes. For example, I've designed a similar stage that I launch atop uh, a balloon tank LR-105 stage, and yeah, I wanted four minute burn time for it instead of five, because um, five was actually losing me delta V. Okay, so let's put a the fairing sides back on just so we can measure how high up to bring this. That looks about right. However, <laughs> the tank is a little too tall, poking up through the... Okay. There. That's that's a good tank dome. Alright. Let's put some separation motors in here. Now, oh, get rid of the fairing sides first. to axymmetry. And let's make sure they fire on the right stage, which is this stage. And we're getting, what, 300 kilos to orbit? Yeah, that's fine. All right, so that's save our progress, because you never know. Um, now, happily, we can go up a tech level on these as well. Because we've unlocked basic orbital rocketry. They tech up on the rocketry nodes. So they get a little more efficient and produce a little bit more thrust. So now let's do the lower stage portion. We want to bulk it out to, whoops, that's fine. Uh, hmm. So the top needs to be 1.45, and that's a little too high. That's about right. Um, now, as for the lower stage, this is going to essentially be a Thor-like launch vehicle, which means we want a 2.5 meter lower stage, I think. Um, technically, Thor had a, you know, a conic section at the top, but we're just going to be straight 2.5 meter up until the inner stage. Okay. Now, we definitely need to get a, rid of that avionics 
unit because we're going to need more than 45 total tons. Um, so it's 0.35. This is only 50 kilograms more, but can do up to 120. It does cost some to 6 million to unlock, but we need to pay it eventually. So we'll do that now. Okay. So yep, we're gonna do that. And we're gonna bring this out to two point two meters or so. Uh, I think we're going to want to keep the fins. Um, and here's our LR-79. 2.5 meters. Now, uh, it's worth noting that, of course, American stages use and use imperial measurement. Um, so. I believe this is actually four and a half feet um, in real life. Able Star, I'm not super sure. Uh, Thor is is eight foot, uh, which is uh, eight times point three zero four eight is two point four three eight four meters. Uh, but I'm not going for replica, uh, so we'll just go with two point five. If I were going for a replica, I'd get the masses right. I'd add the conic section at the top of Thor. Um, Anyway, uh, and put instead of where I'm about to put the verniers, I'd put them down in those those little, like vernier, boxes on the Thor had had little like things at the end of its boat tail. Um, anywho, plop that on, um, and we wanted a couple of these verniers. Okay. Uh, so that's actually mostly done. Wait, what do I have three? Why do I have three of them? Editor extension sometimes is weird about symmetry numbers. Um, and I think actually I want to bring them down to the bottom of the boat tail. Um, because then they won't hit the boat tail when they, when they actuate their gimbals. Um, right, so we brought that down this down. Those are the retros. They fire here. Uh, we'll stage together. Um, Alright. Now we can go ahead and fill these tanks. No, that's the, ba it's the fairing base. Alright. Now we're going to fill this one with uh, interesting. So, the verniers in the LR-79 do not have the same mixture. Uh, the LR-79 has 39.3% kerosene, 60.7% LOX. The verniers have 38.21... yeah, okay. Uh, so we'll fill it with the main engine, because it's not really going to matter that much. Um, actually, I mean, I guess what we could do is we could fill this with... I think even just filling that tank with the mixture for the verniers and then that with... Um, with the, with the, the mixture for the main engine is going to be still too much for that, so we'll just fill with the main engine. Um,
come on. Uh, 39. And... Yeah. So that tank is too long. It also is perhaps slightly optimistic in terms of utilization. 2 minute 40... 87%? Nope. Eh, we'll just... Okay, 2 minutes 45 seconds. Um, and I guess, because I was just right-clicking on this, I should pause a second and explain how I, how I deal with fairings like this. Now, interesting note about fairings. They only have the uh, EDOX procedural fairings mod. They only have colliders on the cylindrical section. Um, you'll note down here, I'm hovering over the fairing and I'm getting it, it's highlighting. Um, up here, I'm hovering over the fairing. Nope, not highlighting. I can click, it doesn't pick up. If I click down here, it would pick up. Um, so you can just, you know, right click on the interstage through the fairings there. You can right-click on the engine, you whatever. Uh, in cases where you do need to actually go through it, if you look at the dividing line between the two fairing sides, if you nail it right on that dividing line, you're probably going to miss both fairing colliders and hit whatever's under it. So, for example, let's put these back on. Now, note how there, if I clicked here, because there is a collider, it's cylindrical. But, check this out. If I right-click right on the dividing line, I get the tank. So, that has, that has helped my life a lot. Um, Alright, so now let's look at, our, look at our delta V. Now, interestingly, uh, I wasn't that far wrong with that assumption on the payload. Um, so, let's up it a little bit. Um, I think about 9,000 is what is is about right for this. No, uh, nine. Well, I don't know. Let's try 90, uh, Also, when did these decouple? Oh, they decouple down there. That's not correct. They need to. They need to decouple up here. Uh, also, it looks like, for some reason, this is down to no longer five minutes. I'm not sure what happened here. Um, Alright, I think that's probably enough to get into orbit. Um, yeah. Decent liftoff thrust away ratio, which, uh, and let me just while I'm here check uh, what is the mass at SEP. The mass at SEP is just over five tons. So if we get rid of the fairings, we're still just over five tons. That's really kind of annoying uh, because our avionics limit is five tons, and part of that is just from adding these retros. Um, what is our payload right now? Our payload is. 400 kilos. Now, I think that that will work. So let's... How, how do we get around this? Um, hmm. I mean, the real way we get around this is for me to get off my duff and make procedural avionics, but that's that will be a while. Um, so I think the way we get around this is the fact that um, no, because we actually will need to translate some on SEP. So yeah, let's let's go. Let's move it down slightly. Guys, right. All 
All right, and let's try four minutes and 45 seconds. All right, and that's not, I don't think that's going to materially change. All right, so yeah, we've this is at a hundred percent utilization because it's just a don't which is actually kind of cheating because the nitrogen um, yes, in fact, that's definitely cheating, and I really shouldn't do it that way because it's cheating um. <laughs> So we want, yep, and now let's add a couple nitrogen tanks. Um, Ninety degrees, two X. We want tank type fuselage, fillet cylinder. Three hundred millimeters and I want it auto surface is weird. Where did the nitrogen go? There it is. Okay. So that's that'll be fine. Gold foil. All right. Yeah, we're still under five. But if we extend this out, we're over five. Let's go for an even 450 then. Yeah, that gives us, that leaves us some headroom, but Okay, also let's verify. Yep. Sometimes you hit the 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 middle node instead of that floating node. Um Yeah. So that's all good. Um Once again. Oh, these these things will separate like that. Well, that's fine. We can we can leave them as things that separate. Um Put the fairings up here. 9102 meters per second. That's decent. I think that will get us to orbit. Uh, I think because I want to actually know what the payload of this is to low Earth orbit, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do a sim, which I generally don't like to do. Um, I especially don't like to do when I with launch vehicles because I kind of know how they work fairly well by this point. Um, but we'll we'll launch this on a sim. Um, so, clamps go in one stage and they go above the engine. Um, yeah, let's see how this flies. Forget whether we're during the day or not. Let's find out. We are. How nice. Okay, so we'll go ahead and send this. Interesting note, it's only ever so slightly more expensive than the launch vehicle we had before. Uh, the other thing we want to do is definitely put an R&D team on it. 84 funds a day. But we have money, so that's fine. Well, let's go with the mediums. Uh, no, actually, no, because we want, we want it to be as researched as possible before we get it built. So 44 days times 84 funds is 
less than four million funds. That's not bad at all. Um, 84.29 data times 44 is, oh, that's more data than, all right, 2,500 over 70 is 35. Yeah, so we can hire the medium team. Okay. Now let's do the same for this. We can also hire the medium team. We'll get to 2,500 data fairly fast. Um, so, yeah, I'm trying to think if I've forgotten anything for this, for the sim. I don't think so. I think we're good to go. Um, I hate having to over-provision the nitrogen on this quite so much, but if we're going to restart later and we have to do Elledge Burns and fine-tune our orbits, then that's that's understandable. Um, mostly just annoyed it that MechJeb's pit is no longer so good with them. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, we want to light this during staging, actually. So yeah, let's do the sim. Let's see how much the sim costs. Uh, $140,000. That's not that much. And 15 minutes is plenty. We probably could get by with, with like 8 minutes, but 15 minutes gives us time to wait to coast for a while and test a relay. Yeah, this is sort of a short, fat, squat, variable star, um, but means I don't have to deal with multiple tank pieces there so much. Um, right, so what do we want for our turn start velocity? I think we want 85. Turn end, I think we want... Uh, almost a five minute upper stage. Uh, I think we want, but at the same time, nine plus G burnout. I think 120 is probably fine for that. That actually may be overestimating turn end. Uh, let's let's see how this works. We'll also use the sim to find that. That's interesting. Oh, I know why that is. Because none of these things have any reliability. So, first thing I'm going to do is turn off test flight for the sim. So that we can actually see how the thing works. Because I fully expect failures like that. These things will be horrifically unreliable. Uh, this option doesn't actually work at the moment. Not really sure why, but we can disable test flight here. So, let's try again. Also could get by with smaller fins, but they won't really materially change our Delta V to orbit. Or our Delta V capability either. Either way. Um, so yeah, so... Verniers are working fine for roll control. Um, the other thing I would do is action group this engine to shut it off so that the verniers can do fine post-boost control. But we have a second stage, and the second stage will mostly do that, so that's fine. Yeah, this does really look off for Thor Star, but it's... it's because I want that to be one tank. Um... I guess I could do peak two and make it one big tank that curves inward, but you know, who cares?
kilometers downrange, a thousand meters per second, height 27 kilometers, minute left of burn time on the main stage. on first stage burnout. Yeah, I guessed right. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Final flight path angle, six. Why? That was bad. So we were rather above the flight path that I wanted us to be on. Well, it's a sim. It doesn't actually matter. so it doesn't quite do as much hunting. Yeah, this was not a sufficiently optimal ascent to actually tell me much of anything, so I'm going to restart the simulation. Who'd have thunk that sixes would look like zeros? But they kind of did. Alright, so I have to tear and test flight off again. Mission. Good thrust, lift off. And I think we actually even want 110 for that. But we'll see. Yeah, so Thor, Abel, and its descendants, of which this is kind of more or less one, um, basically the longest lived rocket series in US history. Um, the last Heritage Thor launch vehicle um, has yet to fly, the last derivative of it being the, the Delta II. Um, and basically that combination of the Thor first stage and LR-79 or later an H-1 derivative engine and then an AJ-10 based upper stage flew from 1958 through still flying today. Um, payload has grown remarkably and essentially they've stretched that first stage enough that it's actually a sustainer. It burns for like four minutes or something, and it's got a crap ton of solids. Um, but, yeah, it's still, at its base, very clearly derived from this. This is not the original Abel. So, like, Thor Abel, which became Thor Delta, was, you saw that, that second stage that I had before. This is Abel Star, which is like the, the fat stage, which wasn't used till Delta E on the Deltas. Um, much longer burn time, can restart. This this will basically be my workhorse for this tutorial campaign, I would think. Um, this and, and its derivatives. But once I get the relighting Agena engine, I'll s probably swap to that. Um, and then if I put that on top of something with two LR-79s or may maybe three LR-79s in the second stage and use that as third stage, then I can really throw some serious weight interplanetary. Um, or send, for example, a film return mission to the moon, or whatever. And 
burnout. Sap and ignition. Jeb doesn't quite go nuts. Fairing sap. And I think we want a bit of up pitch so we don't have as much in the way of steering losses, and also because ah, that was turning it down too much. Let's try 50%. Also because our per our apogee, which will become our perigee, is still a bit low. So, 3 minutes 25 seconds to stage burnout, minute 44 seconds to apogee. Gonna try to stretch things out. Climbing, so we're actually going to want to not pitch quite that much, and we'll fall back down after Apogee a bit. Um, let's do a quick check and see if we're going to make orbit today. Orbit 5300, 2500, we'll make orbit with about 80 meters per second to spare, I think. Let's watch our nitrogen usage as we try to settle down the roll. Not that bad. All right. Okay, so we're going. We're actually. I pitched up a bit much. Um, we're going to end up with a higher orbit than I might have liked, uh, but that's okay. Probably a 204 or 5 kilometer circular orbit. We need 1380 and we have 1430. So 50 meters per second extra, which, you know, is not an unreasonable amount to hold spare. Um, yeah, so had my ascent been somewhat better, could have lost some of the steering losses, go to a lower orbit with lower gravity losses, um, probably more like 70 meters per second spare. I think that means we could get 450 kilo. I think this was 400 kilos. I think that means we'd probably get 450 kilos into orbit. Um, So now I'm going to have to pitch up slightly to keep that all normal. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, so yeah, about 45, 50 meters per second spare, plus that, 70 meters per second. Um, and we put, yeah, 400 kilos of orbit. So yes, I would call that successful. It needs an 85, 110, 35 turn. And let me just verify that that, in fact, we wanted 70 less, so, well, say we took 50 less, so 90, 100, four twenty-eight. yeah, so about four, about 420 kilos. Um, So yeah, that is a that is a reasonably successful launch vehicle. Um, let's go back slightly and yeah, okay, that's that's pretty decent. Um, so yeah, that'll be our, our light launch vehicle. Um, then. I think for design of the heavy vehicle, it will have to wait till the next episode because I'm pretty tired um, and I have to do more fixing of KSP tomorrow. So thanks everybody for watching. I uh, hope to see you all again soon. Uh, yeah, thanks. We actually we didn't have failures this episode like last episode, it was mostly because we were doing a sim and turn test flight off. Ah uh, well, but yeah. Anyway, see you again soon. Thanks.